uh, sorry, excuse me. Yes, You'll Dan. have to, instead of unmute, it's start video. You'll have to start your video, not unmute. You were saying That's unmute. what I meant to say. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's what I was meaning to say. It's just one of those mornings. Um, but it's, <laughs> not, it's not letting me uh, start oh, my video. No so I'm just going to go ahead anyway. Um, we have this beautiful slide up and we have um, Alita here. So we'll just move forward. Um, hi, everyone. This is Angela, Vice President of our International Feng Shui Association's USA chapter. It's been a while since I last... Um, saw and was with many of you last fall. Um, warm welcome back to our virtual space and our first learning table event of 2022. Um, in that time, I was married and I'm now splitting my time between the US and Germany where my husband lives. So um, I'm actually in the US today and I'm, I'm happy to be with all of you. I'm gonna be hosting. And today we are delighted to once again bring back Master Aylita Leto. She is a consultant with 20 years of very practical, amazing, vast experience um, in Chinese metaphysics. And I will be giving you a bit of a more formal introduction um, on her in, in just a moment. But um, first off, I want to just let you know we're going to be recording our event today. Um, I'm going to have you all muted, uh, with the exception of Aylita so she can share with us her wisdom. Um, but I encourage you all to use the chat if you'd like to. Um, and um, yeah, uh, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and, and just share with you a bit about Master Aylita Leto. She, well, many of you actually may recognize her. She um, did a 2021 learning table event for us on forms feng shui last year. She's originally from Latvia. She now resides in San Jose in the, in the Silicon Valley area of California. Um, she is very involved in the feng shui community. I know she's written quite a bit for the feng shui journal. She's been so gracious and um, willing to share her knowledge with us in the um, USA chapter here and um, travels quite a bit. Um, from my experience talking with her over the past year, she's all over the place doing her consultation, her teaching, her training, and, and continuing to be a student as well, which I love that balance. Um, you know, she is very well-rounded having um, studied medical Qigong, Taoism, the Mantic arts, along with classical feng shui. And today she has a really interesting conversation that she's going to share with us on this topic of biophilia. Is it or isn't it feng shui? So with that, um, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to you, Master Elita. Thank you so much for being with us today. We're really thrilled to have you. Thank you so much, Angela. So thanks for the, such elaborate uh, introduction. So welcome, everyone. Um, well, what can I say? So this has been really inspiring opportunity to uh, quite a while ago, I, I came across, I was actually part of the, one of the conferences for the interior designers in Carmel um, in Northern California. And there were this team of designers, interior designers were talking about biophilia. And I walked through and I like sat through the presentation and all I can think of it is like, oh my gosh, that's might be, that's what they're talking about is feng shui, but in a, just a, not in a, maybe not applying it or interpreting. So this was a, a primary, this was like a tiny, like a seed for me to, um, to get more, to find out more about it, to really kind of figure out what is it and what it's not. And I was like, how can I, how can I embody or how can I use it in a modern terms? Because obviously anything in the contemporary world right now, we, we look for anything else than feng shui and start using, I think one of the words that's been used is biophilia, biophilia, biophilia design. Um, I think it's there, the roots are in feng shui. So well, let's begin. Next slide. So today I would like to talk about the defined biophilia in comparison to classical feng shui. I also want to kind of bring the um, examples of nature and I think the easiest way to 
uh, bring that is through the garden designs. And I will share some, uh, some experience and some practical experience and application and, um, and also uh, share my last, uh, last uh, travels into, into Dubai. So I will hopefully we'll have a, also a question answer time for two as well. Um, before we begin, uh, I want to share with you uh, one of my uh, very basic quiz or basic questionnaire uh, that I use for my clients. And this is something I, I encourage you as well to take some questions down or write it down or maybe take a copy and think about it. What makes you feel at home or physically, intellectually, emotionally, and spiritually? Or how do you make yourself feel comfortable, especially when no one is watching? How do you arrange your surroundings, mind, body, and why? What makes you feel safe and why? What makes you feel free, including being unapologetic, <laughs> kind of, you know, being yourself? What makes you feel alive? And what do you wish you were doing more of? So when I, sometimes I think, well, it's such a simple question. Um, and here is that I'm sharing the, um, that photo that I, I go often to Felton and I hug the trees, <laughs> I hug the redwoods. And this is my daughter and myself. Um, and there is a definitely observance of connecting, earthing, uh, observing, but being in this very gi gigantic kind of environment, imposing the environment. But still these questions come, come about. So next slide. So when we talk about biophilia, it is a love of life, love of nature. Um, there's a lot of, lot of, um, uh, I had quite a selection of books that I, <clears throat> in books of sacred geometry, books of the power of limits. There's the beauty of, uh, you know, a great book of the beauty in neuroscience on architecture. Um, and there's a lot of definitions. And this is just, there was a, some of them. So bi biophilia is a love of life. A space that puts you in direct physical contact with nature, things you live in space that reminds you of nature. Um, when you look at the feng shui, and I was thinking, like, well, isn't the feng shui as well that we we talk about the principle of the Gan Yin principle through adaptation where humans inspired at nature in harmony with physical and metaphysical Christ time and space. Next slide. So there's more definitions, of course, love of nature, focus on human in, innate attraction. Biophilic design is a practice of connecting people and nature within our built environments and focus on connecting to nature by creating a sense of place that optimize physical and psychological well-being. So these are, as I said, they're from so many resources where I'm getting these definitions and still comes to that one terminology. It's like, how do we work with the nature? Next slide. And what I find that feng shui allows us to, to work with nature, we are the nature. We are doing through the adaptation. Even the symbol like Western school would talk about the feng shui as like wind and water and it defines it sim like symbolically creates that particular problems in there when we wanna achieve, let's say people asking for you know, abundance or improving the relationship or improving in health or relying on the cures. So we, we bring uh, Western school perspectives like bringing these cures or like a sources to, to manage it. Where when I step back and go back to them, to classics and go back to all the way where the maybe feng shui was originated, there was a, a way we would conquer, we would step on the land embrace and be the nature. And like, in, especially in a form school, we study the surroundings, we study the landforms, the waters, the, the natural flow of the cycle of time and seasons and, and um, looking at the macro and microcosm of uh, and how everything is connected. And what I noticed that when we do take the feng shui as a, as a, as a base, we are, we are the nature. We are expression of time in the nature. We only have a limited aspect of the manifestation in our surroundings. So 
and different um, I think the what we do in the feng shui we we create these very different levels of awareness that allows us to not manipulate the nature but be more in alignment in harmony with the nature so next slide Um, easiest way, I guess, for us in the West to uh, to speak about the nature or being in the nature, I think we associate to the garden. And I wanted to bring the example just what I just recently experienced by in the classes with my with my teacher. And when he brought up the the simple character of Yuan, which is the you know translation means garden. And you see this calligraphy, how this particular garden, the name, the Yuan, comes, comes about. And it has uh, five different elements coming together. It talks about the, has a first character in the middle with the dust or mountains or earth or soil, rocks, buildings, and sculptures are part of it. Then you take defined space, you know, defined space that encloses world with the entry and gates. It also has a space to make you walk around, which usually in Chinese garden design, we notice these could be a pond, uh, like a ponds or lakes or water features, not directly exposed, but you, you make it like occupies the center. And of course, then is the connection to the, to the person or people um, that also these characters in, include uh, symbolizing the flowers and shrubs and trees, people, grass, plants. So when you look at the, the character, the Yuan, which is garden, and then uh, relating to why do we have, um, you know, why the philosophically we bring these elements and why, we, why do we talk about them? And I think this is, again, this is this, this connection to the nature just brought in a human scale. So next slide. So Western and Eastern view about the gardens, there's a, there's a main difference. I, I believe by you know being from Europe and going places, there's a Western viewpoint is people control the nature. It's almost like the larger areas is usually exposed to tendency of uh, having very symmetrical aspect, very fine lines, uh, further views, shorter views, um, may, may, like extensively man-made structures, but it's all, it's all more in a very rigid pattern where I think when we're visiting the Easter, like um, uh, Chinese garden or Japanese garden, basically based on uh, Eastern viewpoint, we always feel that we are part of the nature. The garden tendency is irregular and free form, but it looks natural. Even it's kind of man-made, but it looks natural to it. Um, it does create the sense when we're seeking the privacy and we're seeking the uh, way that we can contemplate and, and maybe go within. Of course, there's also many different garden types, but like in general terms, there's a sense of like empowerment and a sense of the, uh, integrating something that's very intimate. So next slide. These are the, just a few examples from my travels um, in China and Japan and just giving you the, the, the how some, some recognizable elements, you know, the dragon or, or rocks and pavilions, um, the waters and the flowering trees or plants are exposed or how the moon gate captures one of the, you know, let's say the focal point at a certain area or kind of picture to it. Uh, so these are the, just the very basic architectural elements that we may experience. So next slide. And as a contrast, this is examples of the Western garden when we're looking at a symmetrical layout, extensive areas of lawn, long and panoramic views. So avenues of trees or shrubs and flowers gathers in, earth, in beds. So water flowing from elaborate fountains. That's probably, I can't wait. Uh, going going to Italy this summer, so looking forward to experience. So next slide. Um, before I bring the examples, so when we consider when we analyze the land and the selected the site, we we'll look at the flow and containment. We're looking at the connection between the macrocosm and microcosm, and 
connection between outer forms and inner forms. These are just very, very basic things. When, when, we, when we have the feng shui, like wearing our feng shui hat, when I step on the land, when I connect, integrate with the client, these are the, the you know, basic principles. Next slide. And this particular one, I want to share my example or a practice practically working uh, here uh, in between 2018 and 2020. We worked on a project for NIAC, the local business for uh, building the headquarters building, nation headquarters in Santa Cruz. And this started from the selecting the land, you know, identifying the, all the pros and cons. Um, and uh, this is, you can see me standing <laughs> right in the middle of nowhere, almost nowhere. And next one, next slide. The, the idea of course was to make the building very economical, making very practical, uh, net zero, uh, all the requirements for eco-friendly, um, you know, sustainability. And of course, with the feng shui aspect was also it would last long, long lasting. And this was the previously, <clears throat> there was a previously uh, different feng shui uh, practice was applied, uh, not by me. And also our, I'm giving the example of how the architects would look when client just requests something, you know, we want to build a building. Next slide. Um, I had one before, I believe, yeah. Yeah, that's strange, it's not, okay, no. Okay, yeah, this one. So being a part of the team, and when, when I stepped into this project, after the basic uh, kind of work was done, um, a land was selected and, and there really was not uh, much to, to kind of work off. One, one basic thing was for me was important to realize like, I can't control what's gonna be built around this building when it's gonna be finished. And it's really that caused me things like, how can I, how can I use the feng shui to manip not manipulate, but to improve that I will never be regretting that the windows that we're gonna be seeing and connection to the, uh, uncontrollable laws because we don't know what business is going to be built around it. How can I still maintain the connection to nature, not to be concerned about the views? And the only kind of solution to that was the courtyard, to creating the or introducing this concept to this project. And I have to tell you, it did take me and um, like personal kind of humbled effort to, to speak up at the one of the meetings and, and suggesting how about if we create a courtyard house, uh, if we use the courtyard principles for this project. Um, next slide. There's a different, uh, more I was studying, um, more I study Chinese medicine and um, studying the medical Qigong. There's always, if there's a reason why, why and how we can benefit when we connect to the nature. And of course, for this kind of, for this structure, for this business building to, to allowing or to, you know, kind of pushing more this concept of the courtyard in within the building where I start believing more and more by coming across, uh, for example, from one of the acupuncture bo books, I don't know if you know, but when we correlate acupuncture points, um, like a me, uh, you can correlate it also to the courtyard. So it could be the benefits, the brain clears the mind and lifts the spirits, especially these Baihu points, um, uh, DU24 and DU20. And we can, if we think about the feng shui is the acupuncture of the land, this allowed me also to, to make the suggestion with more confidence. So, so when we did discuss um, in the project, I started thinking how, you know, giving the reasons why. The biggest reason why it was that 
people who are going to be there will be 200 people on a daily basis occupying this building, working in the building. And they're going to be continuously connecting to the courtyard in all three levels. Um, of course, adding the elements of the water, you know, yin and yang, basically having the water fountain in more in the north and then reflective pool towards the south, the connecting river or creek, bringing the boulders, the rocks, the moon gate, um, having the land, like um, the passages that would be meandering paths, um, nat native, uh, native um, greenery and shrubs and, and uh, grasses. Now also this particular space also has turtles and little fish. Uh, I was just there a couple months ago to visit. So it all started to make sense how good it feels. So next slide. And um, so this is the finalized, kind of finalized early state project. But what I want to show is this, don't you, would you agree? It is a biophilia as well. It's even the elements that we are creating or integrating. We allowing the interpretation or correlated thinking to be applied. And when the client is aware, what are we creating that that's, does not become like a, a cure industry of the feng shui, but it becomes like how we work with the immediate surroundings of the land. So, so yeah, I, I personally, uh, I do love this project and I feel that we accomplished to its max, not only by bringing the, some of the, you know, the yin and yang lines with the pebbles like filling in the roof that was, as you can see on the second level, that on the third level, we can see that. Um, the moon gate, the focal point, separation with the, in more contemporary way to see the walkways and passages, which is again, creates the yin and yang of the close and open uh, scene and to be seen, intricate, you know, moving from high to low, reflective, uh, sitting down, uh, especially in the evenings when the night lights would come and ex kind of, uh, so all these elements just allows it to, again, be in a human, kind of in a human scale, be in the garden in more of a contemporary setting. And I, I think that is that <laughs> it is a part of the biophilia as well. So next one, there's more examples. Um, next one. So this is how the finished building is um, two years ago. Uh, it was 2020. And of course, right now I haven't updated, but there are quite a few. There's a five um, majestic buildings are right now surrounding. And when we talk to the owners right now, they said it's like how good it was because now I can't even take this, this type of angle as my own camera because there's a, you know, there's a building already built in, the, in its surrounding. Next one. So there, this will be the some examples I brought from residential and business uh, examples to talk about biophilia and feng shui and where do they match across. So again, uh, when we considering, when we analyze the land, it's we're looking at the bigger picture and landscape, identifying the feng shui forms. We also analyze the per, you know, person's charts uh, looking what their intentions are and and kind of gradually looking from the largest scale and scaling it down. Next slide. Um, this particular example I brought of those who practice Bajai Mingguan or Eight Mansions um, School of Thought. Uh, <clears throat> I have a house in a neighborhood in Los Gatos and this particular house is the west facing property and you might think is when it sits in the east the west is not the the most profound area and instead of neglecting or instead of the creating some kind of uh, a fear <laughs> i guess for that's maybe commonly commonly uh, adjustments are done based on fear for the when the people are doing just the when they do their feng shui by using google or not knowing or not uh, knowing better. But I find this is a really beautiful solution for the Chia Ming. 
And having the labyrinth, uh, I found was one of the ways to slow down the energy, protect the chi from the, um, you know, affecting the main door, staying really, really in close connection to the neighborhood and neighbors, because everybody for the who passed around, goes, walks the street, are, are welcomed to walk the labyrinth. So this definitely does, even the, the energetic, like in the West, for this particular example, um, you might think it's like, oh, what can I do? I can't use my main door now. It's like, you can differentiate the areas and start thinking in like a little bit further, a little bit of the sense of like, wow, if I create this sacred space that heals the land and my neighborhood, as I protect the others, the other layer, I am protected as well. And um, of course, as you may know, the different labyrinths have a different um, properties for uh, improving your well-being. And in my practice, I have quite, uh, I have quite used quite a bit of the suggestions, uh, especially when we talk about the gardens and and open spots of land uh, for the other properties. So you might consider as well. Next slide. <clears throat> This was a residence for in Napa, and when I have, um, before I start working with the client, there was some uh, initial need to, you know, how to make, make a person to be more grounded, more connected to the land, um, did have some health issues um, at the beginning, so, and that's why the examples um, internally, of course, I did my I did my best to ground the wall, like you know, adding the instead of the light background wall for the for the bedroom, we um, we painted in very deep, like a night sky blue color, which really well resonated with the with the owners. And as the as the key to the because the property has a quite a you know larger surroundings, uh, and we and Napa is in the more like a hilly side one of the ways to kind of connect or to use the element um, of in feng shui, I came on, I suggested to do the rock really, really enormous, like a boulder to select it that is connects to the Sierras of the land, bringing the chi from the Northeast, connecting with the Southwest because that was in a support of the female chi or feminine. So um, I do, <laughs> it's, it has been a great success with this particular because the energy shifted instantly. Um, the person started, she started to using her office. If you see right across from the rock, there's a two windows, that's her office. And the, the things just pivoted. As soon as she connected to the land, to the garden, named the rock, uh, visits or sits on the rock often. Uh, always sees the rock of uh, this, this boulder um, and symbolically connects. So again, isn't that a way that we could bring the uh, awareness of the, of the person in connection to the nature? So again, is it or is it, is it just feng shui or it is the biophilia and a feng shui and it's appropriately planted or made to function that is in harmony with the land and the person. Next slide. This is a, since we are in the year of a water, uh, water tiger, I could not miss this particular uh, case, uh, case study that I had in Morgan Hill. Um, client reached out and, and said, well, I had a client, uh, I had a feng shui practitioner coming to see my house 20 years ago. And I was thinking about making some changes, want to make some changes, kind of feel stuck. And they found me. I said, this is our first, very first visit. The image that you have on the right-hand side, the rock. Um, I first, I always, in my practice, I walk the land, I walk the chi, kind of get the, get the understanding, get the feel to it. And as soon as made the corner, around the corner in the east side, southeast side, I look down and then on this ro rocky place, I see this, I see this just the, the, 
the pivot of the rock and the facade. And it says, you have your, you have your spirit rock, you have your tiger. And she's like, like what, <laughs> what tiger? Um, again, you probably have heard the saying like imagination leads the mind and mind leads the chi. So for me, this was such an inspiring moment because I kind of cr created this connection that she has the native Indian land, like in its, in its proximity, probably, you know, thousands of years ago, that's where they were settling. And there's something that naturally in the rock, in its surroundings would, would be based, but never, never seen. So it's, I guess sometimes you do need the uh, feng shui eyes to, to get, the, get the notion of that. So next slide. And of course, we're transitioning to inside then. The before was uh, this particular room was also facing this south, but the kind of the tiger and the rock was more in the east and southeast on the outside on the deck. And um, on a basic principle, I'm not criticizing here, but on a very, very primitive way of interpreting feng shui, the, the previous experience was that they suggested that uh, was suggested to paint in yellow, which is very, you know, that goes with the, with the south side golden colors. And the fireplace was not working. There's no connection to the outside. And my basic solution was very practical. I wanted to connect to the suns. I wanted to, 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 to actually have the empowering the client to connect to their, to their kind of backyard, but to connect to the valley, to the green valley that was went beyond them. So, and this was just the night before when we took the picture of the, taking the fireplace that they never used because it was broken and creating this, the double sliding open to the deck. Um, the next slide, what a huge difference. And also adjusting the colors. Sometimes I think um, interpretation in feng shui by practitioners get too shallow. We get very rigid about, well, if there's our money corner, there's our wealth corner, there's a south and there's a red color, green color, etc. I mean, it just becomes like a, 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 like a formulated math. And we're forgetting a really analyzing, you know, what does it take for that element to manifest? When we have, for example, this particular room, if it's a south facing, I invite it to be more contained, cooling, you know, giving the colors. And uh, believe it or not, the, when I suggested some of the colors, the scheme of this, um, the teal blue, um, green kind of mix, it was like the client just responded instantly. This is like how much they wanted to paint in the past but because of believing in feng shui, this might not be the good that we can suffer through. Again, when I practice and walk the chi, do I feel it or do I go just by formulas? So I think when the classical formula, we do as a practitioner of classical feng shui, we do stay connected to the nature, to the physical and metaphysical surroundings of the space at all times. And more we are tuned to the, uh, the immediate environment, more you understand the qualities of the uh, microcosm, I call the microcosm, like micro, microclimate even of the area because everything changes, everything's an influence. More you connect and ask the client to also describe their feeling about the space. That would allow us to maximize the adjustment and bring the the best solutions. This is how the room is now. The same room with the previously had the fireplace and not working fireplace, no connection, because the belief was that they cannot be exposed directly from the main door to, and they believe was that, you know, if you see the, the if you see this uh, through all the way to the backyard or it's not a good feng shui. So, well, it's quite good to my terms as, as it turned out um, for this family. So next slide. 
um, the same house that was the connection now to the spirit rock and that was for their for their bedroom there was a lot of changes in this as well so something the space was felt very cramped and overbearing like with this uh, big um, big armoire um, suggestion was to open up and especially it was uh, integrated also with the flying star um, later on analyzing the flying stars so connecting um, reaching out and this particular case it was also connecting to the spirit rock to the tiger so now the client could go out in a deck enjoy their morning coffee with the morning sun and feel like they are actually spiritually connected as well to the land next slide um, and this one is the office for Howell Electric. So this was a very interesting. I did originally a client, uh, for this client, I did originally a feng shui for their home. And then the, uh, the head of the uh, then husband, he started to kind of be curious about the feng shui. And they were doing the remodeling for their office. And I'm, I'm originally they said, well, they're going to just have like a really nice green, um, just a simple patch of land, just fill it up like a, like a, you know, when you do the golfing, it's like, well, you can do something more to it. So when he listened, when I explained that this particular office main doors were facing Northeast, what this allowed me to do is to bring it again. I worked with the, uh, the directionality, like the macrocosm of the Northeast, uh, connecting to the this beautiful um, lines of the of the mountains in the in Sierras and and started like talking to the person about how is their you know how does they feel about the business how do their things are going you know if, what would what would they and this is a family owned business of course they want to last longer they want to be stabilized they want to have their employees not to rotate as much have a connection with the clients. And one of the simplest solutions, instead of the having just a very flat green lawn, we did create it more like a hub, like really kind of rising it up. And suggestion was go to the go to the um, to rockery and connect and find your rock. So this particular rock has a name, uh, has a purpose. And when the owners, when the CEOs have a sales meetings in this room, in this conference room, is always to get connected because the positioning and the shape and positioning, everything kind of enhanced the something that would have been just a plain green lawn easily to be maintained. So practicality and, and making the connection. And again, it's empowering the mind. And in this particular case, I think this is the, a sense of the biophilia as well, because we're not just artificially setting up, but we have a, we in, in engaging the senses of our being to manifest things. So um, that's, that's my rock at Howell Electric. So next slide. I don't know where we're at. Oh, so this is the fun part. Uh, this particular year, I was very fortunate to go to Dubai, and it was my self-initiative to, I really wanted to visit the Expo 2020 uh, that was coming to closure, and it's, uh, it was ended in March um, 31st. So I, I managed to be there in February, and uh, I had a, quite a blast, because knowing that we are approaching period nine, and everybody's talking about the fire chi, you know, what wouldn't be this the best time to go and experience the desert, everything that is the biggest, the newest, the tallest, the, the uh, you know, the spotlight. And that was the great inspiration for me personally. So next slide. So the Expo 2020, its own definition of this particular was, is, um, is human tend to, it is, was about, how to be more connected to the nature. And I cannot, I think I have like thousands of photos taken and interpretations why it felt so good. And I don't have to say it is like, well, it's because of the feng shui or this is because of biophilia. It was just in a proportion, in a harmony, in 
integrating all the designs and, and, and you know, resonating that something exists in the nature. So that was brought to this, to the Expo 2020. Um, <clears throat> next one. Um, this particular, this, I guess, uh, this, this pavilion, <coughs> excuse me. Is there any, I see there's some text and questions maybe. Um, <clears throat> there's a few slides and I will, and then I can get to the questions. Um, the expo, I want to stand out this, this particular two pavilions or connecting points. One was the I'll wash the connection dome meeting point between the East and West. And then the other one was the United Air Pavilion designed by the kind of replicating the Falcon with its 28 movable wings. It's, it was just impressive how during the day and the night it would change like the really like Falcon and the wings would, would flare up and then they would close at the end of the day or the Awash was the main hub and it was correlated to the heart, the correlate, the heartbeat. Everything was coming to the center, to this absolutely, it was definitely a heartbeat of this particular Expo 2020. Not only because of the notion of the, the concerts and the music and information, but how it was differentiated during the day where there was, you can expose to the, to the greenery and the gardens and, and mist and be, be in a, a place that is shadow, like in a, you're in a, um, away from the sun and beautiful kind of the, even temperature, like the way they were, have created the, the temperature controlled with wa water elements and the greenery and shades. It, I, 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 it, I was amazed because what has also allowed me to do is like how we can work uh, with the nature and technology and the space and architecture and it bringing everything to in a, such a beautiful harmony that it nothing felt um, too out of kind of felt felt good. So when it feels good uh, to me, it's a good feng shui. And I guess it's the uh, this part. This is also by using biofuel because a lot of lot of um, uh, patterns that integrated in the, during the Expo 2020 grounds was related to, to the human, to the human design, to the, to the, to the nature, to the patterns, to repetition patterns, uh, the highs and lows and, you know, you name it. And that's again, brought back the same principles that we also relate in feng shui, where we talk about the feng shui in the garden. And um, so next slide. As the, which I highly recommend, if you ever in uh, Dubai, the make the point of destination would be to visit the museum of the future. And this is like everything was presented as in uh, that you're arriving like in 2071, 50 years from now. The, the even the meaning, like when we look at the, the green lawn, as a set sets on earth, as an organic shape, and then the open or void for the for the futures to like for the unknown future to kind of manifest. The more profound for me was also calligraphy, the poetry, the writing that was integrated instead of the windows, the 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 poetic writings of the meaning for the future was was embraced and that was the filtering the light or connected to the inside out was absolutely stunning. Um, and again, I brought, I kind of, I sense it that it is a good function as well. The, the inner courtyard or we call the, this where the reflective water is. And I took the photo, even the water was shallow but the glass reflection, the mirror was gave me an idea of, well, I'm, I'm contained, I'm inside, I'm protected. I can do the reflection where the main exit was on the other side of the, of the building. So 
bringing the yin and yang forms, bringing the something that's contained or exposed, um, allowing the transition, uh, having the, the meaning is, I think this is all that we do in the feng shui as well. And when we bring the organic forms and expressing in the uh, kind of connected, like reading more about biophilia, I wouldn't say that it's the same as feng shui, but they are integrated and, and directly related. So next slide, I think it's gonna be, oh, so I would love to read that. This is what it's been written by, by Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid. We won't live for hundreds of years, but we can create something that will last for hundreds of years. The future will be for those who will be able to imagine, design, and build it. The future doesn't wait. The future can be designed and built today. The secret of the renewal of life, development of civilization, and the progress of humanity is in one word, innovation. So with this presentation, uh, when, I, when, I, when I was thinking back is these two subjects, biophilia and feng shui, I think it are so interrelated and connected that we can rely on the past experience of the feng shui arts and science and integrate to the future with the with innovative aspect of like how the science, you know, how um, how innovative way of integrating things, you know, for the modern, for the future, for the future world. So yeah, that's kind of I see is like it it is or isn't biophilia is the function, but I think there are a very, very deep connection to the both so we have time for some questions answers and i saw there's uh there are some in the chat yes thank you so much Aylita. um that museum of the future looks so fantastic um you're so lucky to have been able to travel to dubai after you know, so many of us being locked up for the past two years. <laughs> well, it's years, all it takes like, to be. Like, oh, you're traveling again. That sounds so fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Um, if anybody has a question, um, please feel free to put it in the chat. Now is our time to explore anything um, deeper that you want to know. I, I know personally, I love, I love this. It's almost my, I guess my takeaway, Aylita, is there's like a marriage between feng shui and biophilia. It's like they're, they're two separate things, but they also they also can come together as well in some really interesting and beautiful ways. Um, and I, I really appreciated the deeper level of thoughtfulness that gets applied to the environment when, when you have these two different ways that are also quite similar um, of looking at the world. You know, you got me thinking about, you know, I, I actually just recently, my husband and I bought um, my grandmother's home. She passed away a few years ago and um, the family wanted to keep it in the family. And we have this new space now and it has a really large backyard. And I, I, I've always loved labyrinths and I loved the way that you, talked about um, that, that ability to bring a labyrinth in and how to kind of use that um, for your environment in some, some different ways than I had considered before. Um, yeah, so that was really interesting to me. Um, um, I saw there was, some, some yeah, some one of the questions. questions, yeah, one of the questions was, you know, is the labyrinth used as a cure as well as slowing down the chi? Yeah, I mean, and, and this is again, um, when, so, what I encourage every practitioner is, uh, I don't find this as a, I, I don't, I don't, I don't practice cures. I don't like that word cure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I like to, you know, purpose the chi, purpose the energy, because energy is energy, and what you do with it, it makes it good or bad, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in that particular case, um, for the property, like seeing it, the style, there was more like also more like a. Uh, connecting the style with the house and the building 
and not really wanted to do too much maintenance and maintaining the driveway that was the, you know, for the cars to, from coming, like, you know, half moon state. So the lot of land would either require a lot of maintenance or would allow, or allow to actually becoming a connecting point with the neighborhood. And this particular, with the labyrinth, now anybody's invited and anybody can walk the labyrinth. Right. Mm -hmm. So what, what, so the, the instant, the expand, we, 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 even I have this small plot of land on the, on, in front of the property, but I, I actually connect the whole neighborhood. Yeah. Expanding my kind of expanding my chi. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if there is a human chi, I have a connection to it. That's empowering. Yeah. And of course, as a cure as well, you could interpret this. Yeah. That was a slowing down. Um, the chi, but that's but the quality is well. We're not only slowing down, but if there would have been, let's say, vicious or negative chi coming at the home, it's been purified, it's been healed, it's been slowed down, it's been kind of you know, it's been slowed down, not in a uh, blocking it, but healing, you heal the land, you heal a human being. Yeah, to me, I get the the impression of kind of transmuting or transforming um, that in some way. Right. I mean, we as a as a functional practitioners, we are the alchemists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Great, yeah. great um, archetype to um, embrace as we think about the work that we get to do in the world. Um, we are alchemists and, and healers too. You know. Um, any other questions from any of our folks on today's? Yeah, open up. Yes, Otherwise, I'm, yeah. I'm... <laughs> we, have some, we have some time. Let's take advantage of our um, ability to connect with Aylita. She's such a busy woman these days. So it's, it's so wonderful to have you here. Yeah. Any final questions from anyone? Well, as we are then starting to wrap up, I, I thank you all um, for being here today. Next slide. Um, yeah, <laughs> let's show the next slide. Hold on here. There we go. I'll let you finish it up, Aylita, and then I'll <laughs> say a few words. Right, well, uh, you know, I like to, I like to, Joe, I like to bring the humor as always. So um, I just want you to, you know, Whoever, whoever, if you're practicing feng shui or you're practicing design, interior design and architect, I just invite everybody to observe, listen, you know, take a, take a more than one step. Don't jump to conclusions when you, when you kind of arrive to the site. Give, give the, like a pulse of the nature, let it speak to you. Yeah, I definitely uh, took that away from what you had to say today. I loved the, there's also this element that you bring that is that of imagination and reflection that I think are two really important skills for a, a, a good solid feng shui practitioner. Yeah, and self-cultivation is huge. So um, for me, the traveling and exploring and like going, to, let's say, to, to, to Dubai this, this spring, which I, my future idea is to bring more students and, and those who are interested traveling with me to explore, yeah. because I think it has a, a, enormous opportunities to identify the good feng shui and how it's built in a larger scale for all of us to learn. Uh, so, so yeah, uh, there's uh, some content information on the next slide if somebody would like to connect. And please, please uh, give your feedbacks and reach out. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I love I love our feng shui community, and I want to stay be approachable human. Because I'm a, I'm learning from you as well from everybody, and your feedback is always very welcome. So yes, absolutely. Anybody wanting to push Aylita along and making her a uh, trip happen, give her a call so she can <laughs> do a learning event for us all. I think that would be really wonderful. And, um, it, and I love the experience of being able to go somewhere and, and hear from a master what they're, what they're seeing in the environment. Um, so please do feel free to reach out to her. Um, thank you all. It was wonderful to have everyone back together. 
Um, just so you're aware, our second learning table event is going to be held on Friday, June the 3rd at 9 p.m. Uh, I'm sorry, not 9 p.m., 9 a.m. Pacific time, which will be 12 noon Eastern time. And the topic is going to be the Ukraine invasion from a Bazi perspective. So for those of you who um, would like to learn a little bit more about the wisdom of Bazi and the interaction of the elements, um, we have Marina Karamez, uh, who is coming to us from Brazil, who will be comparing the charts of Zelensky and Putin and presenting this interesting information in a, in a, as a teaching tool for those who want to learn more. So um, Aelita and I are so grateful that you are here today. Um, we are at the IFSA are so happy that, that you were able to join us, Aelita, and share your wisdom. We appreciate you so much. And Thank with you. that, um, I wish you all a good rest of your day. Thank you, Angela. That was great. And Alida, that was fantastic. Oh, thank you, Diane. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay. I'm going to stop the recording. Yep. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.